Welcome to Reve at Home. My name is Gracie and this is my friend Derek and we want to thank you guys so much for being here with us today. We've got a live stream that is going to be so powerful and inspiring both spiritually and personally. Yes, you better believe it. And before we dive in guys, we want you to share this live stream with your friends and family on your Facebook page. Also, if you're at one of our San Diego watch parties, take photos, tag us at Reve.Church. Yeah, and as you're sharing this message and taking photos and tagging us, just know this is really helping get God's message to so many people. So feel good about that today and share it with as many people as you can. Yes, and we're going to do the same thing, right, Gracie? Yes. <laughs> and we'll be right back. So we'll see you in three minutes. Welcome to Reve at Home. My name's Gracie and this is Derek and we're so glad you're joining us today. Yeah, it's great to be here with you guys. And to all our newcomers, as usual, we like for you to leave us a comment down low so we can give you a virtual high five. If you're looking for more ways to connect and grow here in this amazing community at Reve, we have small groups for everyone to join if you go ahead and visit our website at Reve.Church. Yes, and we made it real easy for you guys too to connect with us on Facebook and Instagram. We put out daily encouragement. We'll show you what outreach we're doing in the city and you can find out more ways to connect and grow with the people here at Reve Church. Absolutely. In just a few moments, we'll be transitioning to our time of tithes and our offering. And this is such a beautiful time where people from all walks of life can help contribute to the mission and the vision here at the church. And today you can give safely and securely in less than 30 seconds by visiting us on our website. Yes. Before we do that, guys, let's show you this powerful story of outreach. Hey guys, Todd here with our outreach director, Andre. And we just want to take a moment and share with you the amazing impact that we've been able to have as a church in terms of serving our city in really, really practical ways. Yeah. And Andre, it's been amazing. And first of all, I just wanna say how grateful I am to you for your leadership, leading our team, leading these initiatives. Yeah. Uh, it's really been uh, amazing. amazing. Yeah, no, without a doubt, it's been amazing. We reached three million pounds of food donated <laughs> and outreached 
in 2020. Wow. That's three million pounds that we just, God was able to allow us to love the community yes. in unique ways. Yes. And it really changed. And especially the, the last little bit, I want to say thank you to you guys for volunteering, for donating. Uh, it made a huge difference in October, November, and December just to make a huge impact in the community. Yes. And Andre, you wanted to share a little bit of what's going to happen next in this next phase. And we have some really exciting things. I think we have some new trucks, some new volunteers who have really brought a new in inspiration and impact, and they've had connections throughout the county. Parts of the county that currently are not connected to the f other food banks or other outreaches. Yeah. And some of those are the, the Native American reservations around the county. Yeah. Campo, Palma Valley. We're going to outreach in the future just all the way out there to, yes. to individuals that we're really excited to show God's love to. Yeah. And all this is possible because of your generosity. Reve, thank you yeah. so much for being a generous church. So happy to share that story, uh, outreach with you guys. And look, we made it easy for you to give to the church safely and securely at Reve.Church. And we always want to thank the Reve family for your faithfulness and generosity. That's right. Today's message is going to be super powerful. So let's go ahead and dive into it. Two weeks ago, Shannon and I celebrated our 20 year anniversary come on and my wife always says that uh, she deserves an award <laughs> for that but we celebrated big time we went to hawaii for a week and it was amazing i mean the beaches the food the hiking whoo baby it was awesome it was an amazing trip we had been planning this for over six months we were so excited to get away to get away from our kids to get away from you know work and just kind of go and relax and our vacation was awesome until day three on day three we got an unexpected phone call in fact my mother-in-law she was so kind to fly out to the West Coast on her own dime to take care of our kids. She did an amazing job. But on day three, uh, Miss Sandra, my mother-in-law, she called me. And I looked at my phone and, and I, I kind of wondered before I answered it, I said, I wonder what she's calling for. She knows we're celebrating our anniversary. And, and uh, Sandra called and she said, Todd, there's been an accident, your son, face planted on the concrete. He was riding his bike on a ramp and fell and just smashed his face against the, the concrete. And it, it was just, it was terrible. And, and, and here I am, I'm, I'm, I'm listening to her uh, explain this whole accident and I'm in Hawaii, I'm 2000 miles away. There's nothing I can do. He blacked out. He didn't know where he was. He didn't know what day it was. I mean, this was a crazy, crazy, accident in the middle of our amazing <laughs> anniversary vacation in Hawaii. And how many of you know that that's just life, right? I mean, sometimes life happens and that leads into uh, this brand new collection of messages that we're doing over the next five weeks. We're studying the book of James and right out the gate, James starts and he tells us, man, you better get ready because you're going to face trials and temptations. In this life, you're going to have trials and temptations, unexpected things that happen to you in the middle of your vacation. You're going to get those and you're going to face temptations as well. In fact, we've been in a season of trials over the past year and a half almost uh, with COVID-19. Can anybody say 2020? I mean, if 2020 was a movie, the subtitle would be the year of trials and temptations, right? And the first thing that James wants, to, wants us to know is that you're gonna face trials and temptations in life. In fact, he says it in this next verse, in verse ch uh, chapter one and verse two, <laughs> James says this, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, when you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Now, what's interesting is that James says something obvious here, but he says that trials are situations that happen to us. They're outside of our control. Like you're on a vacation and your son face plants, right? I mean, you know, uh, you don't know that 
that's going to happen. I mean, how many of us knew that a global pandemic was going to occur and shut down the world? If you did know that information, I need to talk to you because <laughs> I've got some investments that I, I'm thinking about that I need you to give me some information <laughs> about. We, did, we didn't know that COVID-19 was going to happen. This is the nature of a trial, right? And, and uh, what's interesting also uh, is that uh, James, who's writing this book, you know, and, and we're kind of doing this study on it and, and we're, we're, we're kind of asking the question, well, who is James? <laughs> right? well, why should we listen to what James has to say anyway? I mean, consider it pure joy. Well, what does that even mean? Well, let's look at who James is in verse one. James says this, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes scattered among the nations. Greetings. James starts out and he says, I am a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ, of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's, that's amazing. I mean, think about the humility that it takes for him to say, I'm a servant. Now, that's what James says about himself. But history actually says that James is the brother of Jesus, the half-brother of Jesus. All right. So in other words, James grew up with Jesus. James ate Pop-Tarts with Jesus. James went to school with Jesus. James went to temple with Jesus. James saw Jesus work and, and learn his craft, his trade as a craftsman. Uh, James saw Jesus transition into ministry. James saw Jesus die on a cross, be buried, and be resurrected. James grew up with Jesus. Now, this tells us a lot about James. James says, I'm a servant of Christ. But it also tells us a lot about Jesus. This might be the strongest evidence for, for who Jesus is and who Jesus claimed to be. Because I can tell you this, if I were to ever tell my sister, hey, you know, Lindsay is her name. Lindsay, um, uh, you know, I, I'm the savior of the world. <laughs> I, I, I am God. <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna tell you right now, that would not go well. Why? Because my sister grew up with me. She knows who I am. She knows what I have done. That's not going to work with her. But here, James is the brother of Jesus. He grew up with Jesus. He saw Jesus live every moment of his life. This is the strongest evidence we have that Jesus really is who he says he is. And also, it gives us this immense humility of, of, of James. James doesn't name drop here and say, hey guys, I'm, I'm the brother of Jesus. Just saying, just want to let you know. No, he says, I, James, am the servant of Christ. What an enormous amount of humility that is. Don't you want to just lean in and listen to humble people in your life? Doesn't it just connect you? Do you just want to kind of, you know, learn from humble people? That's what James is doing here in his introduction. This is just a normal biblical introduction. And, but we also know that James is a very influential person. Not only is he the brother of Jesus, but he's the lead pastor of one of the main churches in Jerusalem, right? And so here this, this major you know, player in the first century church, this, this very influential guy, the brother of, of Jesus, he says, I'm a servant. And I'm writing this letter to the scattered tribes, the, 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 the 12 tribes that are scattered across the nations. Now, what, what's that all about? Well, we read in Acts chapter 8 and, verse, uh, and uh, Acts chapter 9 that there had been major persecution that broke out. Okay, so this is, uh, this is uh, you know, AD 60, 64. So we know that Nero uh, was uh, an, an emperor at this time and, and, and he was persecuting Christians on a massive scale killing Christians. So there was a, a, just a, a scattering of the first church. And so, so in other words, the, this church who James is writing to, they weren't able to gather together. Now, at this time, it was because of persecution. In our time, it's because of a pandemic. <laughs> 
But, but the point is, is that James is writing this letter to a group of people that aren't allowed to gather. They, they can't get together. And he's letting them know, hey, I want to help you live out your faith. I want to give you this, this letter, to these words, and he's writing these, these verses and sentences, and, he, and he's like, hey, I want, to, I want to help you live out your faith. And he starts out by saying, listen, in life, you're going to have trouble. You're going to face trials. You're going to face temptations. But I want to help you face those things. And right off the bat, James gives us the why the why behind our trials, right? And, and this is what he says. God uses trials to mature you. God uses trials to grow your faith. Uh, and here are just a couple practical things that we can learn from what James uh, is saying. He, he's saying that, that when we go through trials, you know, when, you're, when your son face plants on that, you know, on that concrete and you're in Hawaii, you can't even do anything about it. He says, um, listen, you got to consider it pure joy. Well, are you insane? James, that doesn't make any sense. We're supposed to consider trials, things that we have no control over, a pandemic. We're, gonna, we're supposed to consider those things a pure joy? No, that's not what James is saying. James isn't saying consider the trial pure joy. He's saying consider what the trial produces as pure joy. Because what he says in these other verses, is what, what, what those trials produce are maturity. What those trials produce is growth in your faith. If we were to do a poll right now and I asked you, how many of us want more trials in life? Anybody? Any? Not, not a lot of hands. Not a lot of hands, right? If I were to ask you this, how many of us want more maturity? How many of us want to grow in our faith? There's a lot of hands going up, right? And what James is saying here is that there's parts of our character. There's parts of our faith. There's ways that we uh, can only mature by going through uh, a trial. And that is the why. That is the why behind um, uh, what God is saying, what James is saying here in, in considering it pure joy when we experience these trials that we have no control over. And second here, what James says is that we have to trust God's process. We got to trust the process. Look at this next verse and verse four. So let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Again, how many of us want trials? No one. How many of us want to be mature? How many of us want to be complete? How many of us want to not lack anything? That's a lot of us, right? Well, it's, it's going through these trials that's going to help shape uh, our character, help grow our faith. But we have to have the right perspective. We have to have the right attitude. That's what he's getting at. That's why we have to consider it pure joy. I mean, it's, it's a supernatural thing, isn't it? Right? And, and, and what he's really saying here is, listen, you got to stand firm in your faith. you got to stand firm in your faith in a pandemic. You got to stand firm in your faith when something happens to your kid. You got to stand firm in your faith when you encounter that financial trial, when you have that tribulation and that really rough season. You got to stand firm in your faith. He's not against you. God is for you. He's cheering you on. He and what's really cool about what James is saying if you read the original language, he's actually writing these, these words. He's writing this letter in a way. He's like, listen, I know you're going to get through it. How cool is that? James is like, I know you're going to get through it. And on the other side of this trial, on the other side of this really tough season, you are going to be mature. Bro, you're going to be complete and you're going to lack nothing. But I need you to have the right attitude going through it. I need you to have the right perspective. Look at this next verse. First Peter 1 and, and verse 7 kind of echoes 
this. It says this, these trials, man, these trials will show that your faith is genuine, that your faith is real. So don't let go of your faith in the midst of that tough season. It is being tested as fire tests and purifies gold. Though your faith is far more precious than gold. So when your faith remains strong through many trials, it will bring you much praise and glory and honor on the day when Jesus Christ is revealed. Listen, that's going to be your story when you get through it. That's what James is saying. You're going to get through this. And on the other side, man, you're going to be complete. You're going to be mature. Your faith is going to grow to a new level. Here's the big idea for today. We win if we don't quit. We win if we don't give up. This theme is all over the Bible, but it's especially here in the epistle, the book of James. We, but we have to have that right attitude, right? We got to consider pure joy. We got to get God's perspective on the trials that we're going through. Here's a bonus opportunity uh, for us as well. W what else can we experience in the middle of a trial? Well, we can get God's perspective. We can stand firm in our faith. What else can trials do for us? Well, in the midst of a trial, we can draw closer to God. Man, how cool would it be is if we, uh, when we go through rough seasons, when we go through trials in life, that we, we look back and we go, man, that was rough. That was really hard. But man, I feel closer to God. I really leaned into God during this time, during this really hard season of my life. And this next verse connects uh, to that. In verse five, James says this, if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault and it will be given to you. What is James doing here? He's connecting this like request for wisdom to our trial. And this is what James is saying. He's like, listen, you're gonna get through this, but in the midst of your trial, I want you to ask God for wisdom. I want you to ask God. I want you to seek God. I want you to work on your drawing closer to God. And I want you to ask God for wisdom. And guess what? He's going to give you wisdom. He's going to give you wisdom generously. He's going to show you what to do. What does this all mean, Todd? Well, as we look through the scriptures, we see that wisdom um, is always, always has this relational quality. Every time wisdom, if you look at Proverbs, you look at through, uh, through James, Wisdom is always about uh, having this relational quality of knowing more uh, of God, being more connected to God. And what James is saying here is that you're not alone in your trial. Just, just use this trial, use this time, use this season to draw closer and closer to God and ask Him for wisdom and He is going to bless you. He's not working against you. He's working for you and he's growing your faith through it all. We win if we don't quit. We win if we don't give up. Now, James moves to a new section here uh, in this first chapter. So you can think of it this way. Uh, so you can think of this as, as a, a coin, okay? And on one side of the coin, you have trials, you have really hard seasons of life, right? And on this other side of the coin is temptations. Now the difference is uh, trials are things that we have no control over, right? My son fell off a ramp, fell off his bike, face planted on the concrete. I had no control over that, right? It's just something that happened. But temptations, we have a decision to make. Right? So you can think about it this way. Uh, trials are obstacles that we face in the road, but temptations are a fork in the road. <laughs> right? So we have a decision to make. Are we going to go down this path or are we going to go down this path? Right? So, so here's what James wants us to know. God is using trials to mature you, but your spiritual enemy is using temptation 
to destroy you. God is growing your faith in a trial, but your spiritual enemy is trying to take you out through temptation. And we get a snapshot of what temptation is all about in this next verse, verse 13. James says this, When tempted, no one should say that God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. Temptation doesn't come from God. Temptation comes from your spiritual enemy. And your spiritual enemy has one mission. He has one goal and one purpose in your life. He wants to steal, kill, and destroy everything that is pure and good from you. See, temptations are different, right? Um, temptations, we, we have a choice. But in order to really walk through this uh, passage of what James is trying to tell us about temptation, we have to understand the process of temptation. All right, so the, the process of temptation starts with deception. Then it goes to desire. Then it goes to disobedience. And then it goes to death. And deception begins in the book of Genesis, in the origin story of the Bible. Okay, Adam and Eve in the, in the, uh, in the garden. Um, if you're familiar with this story, uh, you know that they were in the garden and then they were deceived. They were deceived by the serpent. And do you, know, do you remember what the serpent said to Eve? The serpent, our spiritual enemy, the devil said to Eve, did God really say that? Did God really say not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? Did God really say that? Now see, this is as old as the hills, right? This is what we all experience when it comes to temptation, right? It's like, did God really say that that's wrong? Did God really say not to do that? I mean, how close can I get to the line before I cross it, right? It, it, it's a form of deception sometimes we're deceived so much that we become self-deceived, right? And so uh, it's, temptation starts with deception, then it goes to desire. Now I want to point out here that deception and desire, they're not sin. We can be deceived and, and not sin. We can have desire and we cannot sin. Desire happens inside of us, right? And see, there, there's a desire that's, that's inside of us that, that maybe wants to do something that's wrong. We, we know it's wrong. Uh, we know we shouldn't do it. But it's that desire working in us that's leading us to this next step, which is disobedience. And disobedience is where we cross the line. Disobedience is where we choose. We, willing, we willingly choose to disobey God and disobedience leads to death. This is the process of temptation that happens in our lives. And, and, and what James is trying to tell us is that your spiritual enemy is trying to destroy you through temptation. Now I want you to think about this. What are the core temptations in your life? Maybe this week you want to pray through those. What are the core temptations in your life? You know, oftentimes uh, our core temptations have to do with uh, greed, lust, and pride. Those are the big three. What are the core temptations in your life? And I want you to pray for the, through these this week and see what, what uh, your spiritual enemy is trying to do. He's trying to destroy you through temptation. But on the flip side, God is flipping the script and he doesn't want to condemn you in your temptation. He wants to use your temptation as a template to give you a battle strategy to grow in your faith. Your spiritual enemy wants to destroy you, condemn you, shame you, and guilt you to death in your temptation. God wants to use your temptation to give you a template to give you a strategy to win the battle of temptation in your life. You know, I was talking to a, a, a friend of mine recently, a guy who comes to Reve, and, and he was telling me about his uh, porn addiction. 
and he was just saying, you know, Todd, I, I'm struggling with this. I, I, I find this desire in me that, that just wants to do it. I want to look at porn. I'm kind of addicted to porn. And, and as he began sharing his story with me, I began to share with him and just say, bro, I've been there. I mean, many years ago, I, I was addicted to porn as well. And, and God really had to do a supernatural work in my life. I mean, I'm, I'm a pastor, but I'm also human. And I struggle as well. But I told him, I said, listen, you need to know that in this season, in this season of temptation, you need to know that there's going to be a time that you do not look at pornography. There's going to be a time in your life that you do not want to look at porn, that porn is going to be um, uh, just, you're not, it's not going to be a part of your life. You see, I, I want you to imagine for a moment a world in which we actually live this out. I, I want you to imagine for a moment a, a world that, that, that we actually live this message out, that, that when we go through trials, when we go through really bad seasons of life, that, that we just stand firm in our faith, that we have this perspective where we don't, we don't count or consider the trial pure joy, but we consider what it produces in our life as pure joy. And could you imagine for a moment that when we experience temptation in our life, instead of allowing our spiritual enemy to condemn us in that temptation, that we would actually use that temptation as a template for our lives to create a battle strategy to become victorious and to live a victorious life. Did you know that the victory is already yours? You don't achieve victory. Victory has already been given to you. God has given you the victory through Christ. Could you imagine a world where we become men and women who never quit? You see, we win if we don't give up. Let me pray for us as we close. God, thank you so much for this message. And God, I pray for that person who is going through that trial, maybe facing a temptation. God, I pray that you would give them the strength by the power of your Holy Spirit to live the life that you created them to live. God, that they would get through it and that they would grow in their faith that they would become battle ready through their temptation. God, I pray that we would be men and women who never, ever give up. And I put my faith in Jesus, my anchor to the ground. My hope and firm foundation He'll never let me down And I'll put my faith in Jesus My anchor to the ground My hope and firm foundation He'll never let me Let's declare this with all that we have I'll put my faith in My hope and firm foundation, you
Well, hey, we pray that today blessed you and encouraged you. And this week, we pray, of course, that God would bless you in your leisure, that God would bless you in your labor. And just want to speak Ephesians 3.20 over your life. And now to Him who is able to do immeasurably more than we could ever ask or imagine, according to His great power that's at work within you. To Him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. God bless you guys. We'll see you at our next pop-up service.